Hey. Good evening, everyone. Great to see you all. My name is Alvin Starks, and I'm the director of for strategic initiatives here at the Schomburg Center, and we are delighted to have you here this evening. Uh, tonight's conversation will be based on an exciting new book, The Loneliness of the Black Republican. Right, tonight's conversation will be moderated by Professor Jelani Cobb, Associate Professor of History and Director of the Africana Studies Institute at the University of Connecticut. And we are thrilled to welcome Sir Michael Singleton, Republican political consultant and commentarian and contributor to At the Hill and Orlando Watson, communications director of black media at the Republican National Com Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our guests, Professor Legal, Leah Rigor, Jelani Cobb, Sir Michael Singleton, and Orlando Watson. <laughs> I want to start by uh, asking Professor Rigor uh, why you were interested in this topic, and you know we've had some conversations about this, and why you think it's germane to uh, contemporary politics and what we're seeing right now in 2016. Is when we think about two things, we think about the Republican Party's history of racism, right? Whether it be coded, explicit, uh, coded, implicit kind of appeals, right? but then also explicit forms of racism, which we've seen much more often in the past couple of months. And so I think for, for many people, especially the people of Baltimore, but people who are watching Ben Carson on a national stage, there's something about this icon, this black icon, really reveling this moment, saying that race is not a central concern and saying that racism has not been a concern or in his upbringing, right, in um, kind of the, the Baltimore experience, that feels like a shock. It feels like a betrayal, especially when, if you read Gifted Hands and you know his story, race is such a huge part of that inspiring story. And so in my attempt to think expansively, right, and reimagine the, politi the two-party political system, I'm wondering what happens, right, as a strategic measure, as a purely strategic measure, if we push our imagination even further. Uh, the question for the audience, right, is what would a red out look like? Or a purple out look like? Is it realistic? Is it something that's feasible? Is it something that's absolutely insane? Does it lend itself to black voters having a kind of strategic power. And then, if it is feasible, what would it look like on a state and congressional level? Right? And how would we assume power right, or uh, achieve power in ways that other minority groups, right, and this can be ideologically minority groups, have done in the two-party political system? Perspective as black Republicans, make the case. What is to be gained by African Americans given serious consideration to the GOP? Um, and so whether, whether, whether you're, you know, you're pro-educational reform or not, I, I think that we can, if we're talking about barriers, it doesn't always have to be uh, you know, a, a, a visible barrier, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, th that's just one reason or one issue that I proudly stand with the Republican Party on. And that's school choice. Mm -hmm. say, hey, th these statements are not representative of the party as a whole. I mean, you think about uh, a political party and, and targeting and outreach and mobilization, uh, you think of the party as the product and you think of the voters as the consumer. It's all about marketing. Mm -hmm. If the consumer perceives that your product is not good for them, they're not going to buy it. And I think that's a critical issue uh, that the Republican Party is trying its best to overcome. In the United States, it has never, there has always been political profit and racism. Um, in stirring up the racist resentments of various populations, most often poor whites. That remains a profitable enterprise politically, and the people who we see typically um, profiting from that have been Republicans. And so how do you present the case that, this, that there is a place for African Americans in a party that is opposed to the renewal of the Voting Rights Act, in a party that has been historically opposed to the enforcement of civil rights laws. This country and the data supports this. You look at the crime rates, they're really high. Uh, you look at education, they're extremely poor. You uh, look at economic opportunity, it's almost non-existing. When you think about African-American entrepreneurship, uh, the ability to have access to small loans, to capital, et cetera, it's almost non-existing. 
And most of these communities are communities where Democrats do lead. Now, I'm not saying, hey, you know, the Republican Party has the best of everything, but I do think we do have policies uh, that would provide better economic mobility and educational mobility uh, for African Americans. I think it's incumbent upon the Republican Party to go into the African American community. Uh, is that you have individuals or organizations such as the National Review, such as the Club for Growth, uh, who are coalescing around candidates like a Marco Rubio as an alternative to Donald Trump. So there are factions within the Republican Party that do not believe a Trump nomination is in the best interest of the growth and future of the Republican Party. So, round of applause. <laughs> Backstage, I heard the words brave and courageous, and I definitely feel that tonight's uh, conversation was just that. Uh, we knew it would be dynamic, and part of the work of the Schomburg is to really to explore complex themes.